everyone is concerned about the coronavirus right now. They think it's a new concept. But the fact of the matter is, if you date back more than a century, we've really seen this type of thing before. Here's a conversation I have with Dr. Neil Barnard all about it. We're continuing a really interesting program here on the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee as we take a look at the emerging, it's not even emerging anymore, COVID-19, the coronavirus. It is literally everywhere, and it seems despite no matter uh, all the best efforts that are being made, uh, this thing cannot be contained. But our previous guest said that it was completely preventable, and now to take that message a step further is Dr. Neil Barnard. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Uh, Wendy Orrant was just on the show, and she was walking us through uh, the wet markets where in, in Wuhan where this virus originated. It passed down from animal to animal to eventually human. And I believe your message here is that this is not uncommon at all. Right. Um, the coronavirus is, is um, the latest uh, disaster, but there have been many, many others. And let me point out one thing that's, I think, particularly important, and that's influenza. Flu season. Right. Who knew that flu came from birds? Um, this diagram that I want to show, and forgive me for the people who are, who are just listening to this, but, but you'll be able to see the, the live diagram. Um, back in 1918, the H1N1 influenza virus uh, passed from ducks into humans. And so that virus killed millions upon millions of people. The 1918 flu was just legendary. Um, but then it, it stayed dormant for a while. And then, as depicted in the New England Journal of Medicine, in 1957, the, a new virus, the H2N2, if I'm remembering right, yes, H2N2, combined with that original virus, and they got married, made a whole new baby virus that is novel and to which people were not immune. And so that ended up killing many more people. That was 1957. And then eventually people acquired immunity, and it became dormant for a while. Mm -hmm. 1968 comes back, the so-called Hong Kong flu. Um, this virus that was then existing combined with a brand new virus and made yet another more virulent strain. So what we're seeing is going all the way back to 1918, the, the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of that virus are causing the influenzas today. Moral of the story, if we had not had these poultry farms, this would not have happened. What, what happens is a wild duck might settle down near a poultry farm where there's a huge number of, of animals and there are farm workers. And so they get exposed to this, the, the, uh, the influenza virus will propagate, and then it passes from the farm workers into their contacts, and from there it just takes off. You mentioned the word novel. Um, what exactly does that mean? Because now we've heard about the novel coronavirus. Uh, does that just mean we don't know a whole heck of a lot about it yet? Um, novel means that it's one that, that didn't exist before. Um, you, it's, it's just like taking uh, one animal and another animal, breeding them together and making an entirely new species, so to speak. Um, with viruses, that is possible, and they, they are very promiscuous. Mm -hmm. They are quite re uh, ready to make uh, a, a, a new kind of virus. The problem medically is that we do not have immunity to it. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have a certain amount of immunity to existing viruses, and that will even happen to an extent to the seasonal flus uh, th that come about. But then, all of a sudden, a poultry worker presents to you a new variant of a, vi uh, a virus that came from a duck or some other wild, uh, wild bird that settled down near their flock, passed through the flock, passed into them, passed into their family members, and... Um, and then it becomes a new epidemic. And we can point our finger all we want to at China for why aren't they regulating this better. Look in the United States. You can go into just about any one of these huge farms. They're using antibiotics. Right. Um, they're using antibiotics. They use them because if you can con control bacterial populations, the animals grow faster. And the farmers know this. Um, 70 or 80 percent of all antibiotics sold in the United States are not used by doctors. They are used by farmers, uh, specifically on animals. So what does that mean for you? That means that by the time one of these bacteria that, the, that may be in the animals, uh, the, the, the bacteria have been exposed to the an antibiotics. They are developing resistance to it. By the time that bacterium w makes its way into your body and you get pneumonia, urinary tract infection, you name it, the bacteria has already developed resistance to the antibiotics your doctor wants to use to treat you. Mm. Um, so many people 
Um, doctors have been speaking out about this for the longest time, saying, you are destroying our antibiotics. As long as you use them on animals on farms, the animals, uh, the, the, the bacteria will develop resistance and we can't use them clinically anymore. Um, the farmers have a huge uh, lobby. They want to keep using them. And so does the drug industry. They want to keep selling them to, to the agriculture Obviously. industry. Money. They don't care if you live or die. They want th their bottom line. I hate to say this, but I think it's true. Their bottom line is making some money. Yeah. And they know perfectly well that insulin, uh, not insulin resistance, I'm sorry, antibiotic resistance is going to cause massive problems. Um, and it just continues. For the most part, I, I don't think that the average American is quite aware of how many antibiotics, you know, the, the chickens that they're consuming have actually consumed themselves. Right. Oh, oh yes. And, and that's the big issue. And which leads me to, to another thing, which I want to walk you through. Yeah. Um, this is E. coli. Um, Escherichia coli, um, not a very friendly looking bacteria no. and a big cause of urinary tract infections. And researchers in Canada wanted to know where are we getting the E. coli from? If it's causing a urinary tract infection, typical case, 30 year old woman, she develops uh, frequency and pain and she goes to the doctor and the doctor says, give me a urine sample. And he says, or he or she, the doctor will say, you've got a UTI and we'll have to treat you with antibiotics. Um, the researchers in Canada said, where are these bugs coming from? So it turned out that these E. coli look very much like the, like the E. coli strains that are in poultry, in chickens uh, in particular. And so what they did is they took hundreds and hundreds of samples from patients with urinary tract infections. And you can take a DNA fingerprint of the bacteria, so you can tell exactly what strain it is. They then went into poultry farms and sampled the chickens, and they went into the poultry counter at the store. And in this case, it looks like it's poultry bacteria mm -hmm. that are causing about 70 or 80% of urinary tract infections. Uh, not so much cattle bacteria, not so much pig bacteria, but specifically chickens. Um, and the way it works is that a, a person buys a, a frozen chicken at the store bring the chicken home. On their kitchen counter, they remove the plastic. A little bit of, of juice dribbles out on the, the counter. And you know, you have to remind yourself, chickens are not fruit. They don't have juice. Um, if there's juice that's dribbling out of a chicken, what that is, is water that was in the cooling vat. Uh, when the chickens are, are, are slaughtered, their heads are removed, all the feathers are removed. And then the warm carcass goes into this big cool, cool water bath to cool down the, the carcass mm -hmm. so that it doesn't rot too quickly. Um, well, that water is kind of clean for the first few hundred chickens that go through it, but it, pretty soon it gets covered with feces and feathers and dirt and insects and, you know, whatever. And the, the, the chicken's muscle tissue is quite absorbent. It's like a sponge. So as they're going through the cooling bath, they're soaking up the fecal material from the previous chickens that have been through. And then that's what's dribbling out on your kitchen counter. You take your sponge, you wipe it up, you put it back, your child's pacifier drops on the floor, let me clean that up for you. Same sponge in the baby's mouth. Or it just gets on your fingers or on mm. your cutting board mm. or on your knife. Am I cheering you up, Chuck? Yeah, it's so what are you having for dinner? <laughs> Good gracious. <laughs> it's it's kind of creepy. But um, what the researchers in Canada found is that in 70 or 80 percent of cases, the genetic fingerprint that you find at the, the chicken counter in the grocery store and on the chicken farm is the very same one that you see in particularly women with UTIs. What does that mean? It means that on their kitchen counter when the, the chicken juice was there, somewhere along the line it got into their mouth. And as it went down their esophagus, it stayed in their gut and just propagated there day after day, month after month, and the bugs stay there. And then sooner or later, it's not a very long trip from the anus to the urethra, mm -hmm. and then it creeps up and you get a UTI. Now, I'm not saying that if people never ate chicken, they would never get a urinary tract infection. There are other contributors to sure. it, but the great bulk of them come from chicken. One of the nicest... Uh, attributes of spinach and tomatoes and asparagus is that they don't have intestinal tracts. Hey, how about so, that? So they, so they don't have intestinal bacteria. You know, I just wonder, and, and this is my final thought, I just seriously wonder with 
all of this panic in the world right now, all of this uproar, all of this concern, is this going to be the tipping point to really wake up and, and make some lasting changes here? We saw this again just about a decade ago with SARS, and here we are again in 2020. Um, people have said again and again and again, if people did not raise animals for food, if they don't, did not eat animals, we wouldn't have heart attacks uh, to the extent we have cer certain cancers and diabetes to the extent that we have them now. And with regard to infectious illnesses, exactly the same story. This is another reason to not only to clean up our diets individually, but also culturally. All right. Well, very interesting look inside what's going on uh, with your poultry. Uh, Dr. Barnard, thank you very much for your time. Hopefully the next time you're here, we can talk about some things that are a little bit more pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that, Chuck. Thanks. Thank you. If you like that interview and you want more of it, go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Leave a nice comment below. And for the full interview, also head over to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. New episodes with information and inspiration each and every Wednesday.